you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. What is a cube satellite? Can normal schools really get their projects into space? Are there ways to simulate space conditions or run outer space experiments without breaking the bank? And how does a middle school teacher end up working at the National Science Foundation and starting a business getting middle schoolers into CubeSats? Get ready to launch into the answers in today's podcast. Hey there, Innovation Nation. I think spring is on the way here in the desert. This is the only time during the year when the color green invades the desert, however briefly. I love springtime and I'm sure to start getting a bit of spring fever here shortly. One of the reasons I like spring so much is that summer will be here shortly and that means Inventors Boot Camp is on the way. And I get really excited about Inventors Boot Camp because there's nothing more fun than a room full of teenagers building crazy engineering contraptions with 3D printers and wiring them up with little electronic magic and programming sleight of hand. It's enough to give me spring fever on the spot. To learn more about Inventors Boot Camp, go to www.ttinvent.com slash bootcamp now. That's www.ttinvent.com slash bootcamp now. B-O-O-T-C-A-M-P-N-O-W to find out more about boot camp this year. And speaking of fun with teenagers, few people understand fun, science, and teenagers better than our guest today, Kevin Simmons. Kevin has a small business aimed at getting middle schoolers into space projects and satellite experiments. I don't want to spoil the fun, so let's let Kevin tell us more about it. So my guest this afternoon is Kevin Simmons, and Kevin uh, describes himself as having interest in aerospace education and entrepreneurism, and he has been interested in science for a very long time. And uh, we'll ask Kevin to tell us a little more about himself. Kevin. Well, thanks for having me here, Steve. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to spend a little, little time with you. Uh, I've, I've been very curious about science and aerospace in particular, even as a kid in the 70s, obviously pre-internet. Uh, if you were a space junkie and did not live in Florida, a lot of kids like I did, we would write letters to NASA. They would send us lithographs and charts and, and handouts. And it's really quite amusing when you think about that compared to today with the wealth of, of uh, materials that NASA makes available online for free. But in the old days, I actually had a stamp collection. About as close as I could get to space in the 70s was having a NASA-themed stamp collection from the post office. So what, what is the first NASA launch that you remember? Do you know, I'm sure you know, there are things in your life, you're not sure if you remember them or you remember <laughs> people telling you about them or you remember there's a picture of it, right? So I am not certain if I can remember Apollo at all. I'm fairly certain I remember Soyuz. I definitely remember the first shuttle launch. So I, I don't know if I remember Gene Cernan and Apollo 17, but I definitely remember Soyuz. And uh, once the shuttle started, I was in middle school. That was very exciting. We would stop class and watch every launch for the first several, it seems like. Oh, I remember that. We, uh, we, I went to a small school, and I remember the, the first through fourth grade classroom. We all piled into the teacher's van, and we drove over to her house because there was no TV at the school. We actually went to her living room, and I remember sitting in her living room and watching the shuttle launch. Yes. I, I have awesome memories. Plus, I grew up out in the country and uh, on a farm, so obviously the natural sciences um, were interesting to me. I ended up, and of course it always happens – when you have that one teacher that is able to throw wood on the fire that is your interest on the topic, and I had a really good chemistry teacher, I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons I ended up with degrees in chemistry and biochemistry in college, uh, while at the same time having this sort of secret passion for all things aerospace. <laughs> so this is totally off topic, <laughs> but I have to ask, have you seen the movie 
astronaut farmer? Uh, no, <laughs> you should you should go see it. I I I don't know that it's uh, it has nothing to do with this, but it. It, it does talk about this like deep passion for doing something that people tell you you can't do. So that, from that respect, it's a great movie. I remember every person in my life that told me I couldn't do something. Not only do I remember the positive reinforcement, I remember those that were um, you know negative influencers, and uh, that all those things obviously help shape you into who you are. But definitely, uh, definitely, I remember those. So tell me a little bit about some of the the natural science things that you learned or thought about or considered, maybe some of the stuff you built growing up as a kid on a farm. So on the farm, uh, let me tell you about natural phenomena. Fishing, obviously, if you grew up fishing or hunting, you wanted to understand what the fish or the animals would do, how they would behave, why they would do what they would do. Anytime you can be fishing in a boat with your grandfather, you're using the same bait, supposedly fishing the same way, but he's the only one that catches the fish. <laughs> There's something going on there. So uh, I had the privilege of having two tremendous grandfathers that were very, you know, great role models. But uh, I enjoyed the fishing. What I can tell you is when I was in ninth grade and I had biology, the first time I got to go collect things like pond water and look at it under a microscope, that opened up an entire, you know, new world because protozoa, it was fascinating. You've got things eating things all their whole world is inside a drop of water and so i found that uh fascinating i probably have uh, lesser vision in my right eye today from staring through a microscope with one <laughs> eye for hours and hours at a time so it sounds like you uh, definitely took a strong interest in the biological sciences on the natural science side uh, tell us a little bit about some of the other laboratory experiences you had Sure. So when I was 15, uh, and, and once, you're old, once you're old enough to not work on your family farm and you take a job where you actually get paid, you feel like you're on top of the world making minimum wage because uh, your family thinks if they feed you and clothe you, what do you really need money for? <laughs> so I, was, uh, I went from working in a, a warehouse and a grocery store to working for an oncologist after uh, I had gone to a summer program and I'd hit it off with this fellow and I basically washed the dishes. I cleaned his glassware. Uh, I, I did some minor things with the, the lab, and then I, I took care of the laboratory animals. So I would uh, prepare the drugs, inject the mice, harvest the tissues, and he had an instrument called a flow cytometer, which is a laser that you drop a tiny solution of single cells through the laser beam, and you've pre-stained the, the cells such that when the laser beam hits it, wherever the DNA molecules are, they've been, um, they've been stained. So the dye has intercalated between the DNA base pairs. So basically you have a visual tool to quantify uh, the amount of DNA that was in each nucleus of the cell, which is a wonderful diagnostic tool to look at cell cycle kinetics and, and are the cancer cells growing and dividing. So you could prepare drugs, treat mice, harvest the tumors, and then look at the growth rates of those tumors as they were being treated with different concentrations and types of drugs. Uh, one drug he was testing is called what's called uh, teoxidin and tamoxifen. And those, I think, are still really quite prevalent today for treating breast cancer. So very fascinating stuff when you're 16 years old. So where did you take that? After you worked in your first couple of labs, where did you take the science path? So I was a, a poor country kid, so when I went to college, I also worked in labs at NC State. So I went to North Carolina State University, and I worked in laboratories while I was in school. I worked in three different labs on campus, and then I had the privilege of working at a couple of startups out of Research Triangle Park. So that was always uh, the first time I saw a robot, a piece of laboratory equipment that would do robotic assays, where you could do thousands of samples at a time. Amazing. You know, it was the early 90s, so it was, it was great stuff. So I think, I think having had several different types of lab jobs, I got a nice breadth of experience. So everything from environmental testing to uh, molecular epidemiology, uh, neuropharmacology, biochemistry, plant pathology. I worked in a greenhouse at NC State. They would infect one plant with a virus, and then you would graft portions of that plant onto another. And look at rates of infection. It was it was quite interesting. So after after all of that, what was sort of the path from there uh, 
to where you are now as an analyst uh, contract to the National Science Foundation? Uh, that is a horribly nonlinear path. <laughs> uh, while I was in college, I, I started uh, drilling and uh, the National Guard unit in my hometown. I also was doing, uh, I took the ROTC pathway and I was commissioned an officer. And around the time of Desert Storm, I got orders to go on active duty. So I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I had just gotten married. Uh, I actually, when I completed my time there at Fort Benning, I returned to NC State and finished school. And uh, the semester I graduated, my first daughter was born. So obviously I was in a, a, a place where I needed to buy Huggies and uh, I was ready to uh, go to work as soon as I could graduate. I think I graduated on a Thursday and then the next Monday I started at Chapel Hill at the Cancer Center. There's an institution there called the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center that so started there as a research technician the Monday right after graduation. That was, I think, I was think I was 22 uh, back then. Where, where did, where did their path take you from there? Did you stay there for a while? After graduating, and, and I worked in the lab for a couple of years. It was um, quite interesting work. I was sequencing DNA and looking for common mutations in uh, different types of cancer tumors that had been collected and uh, preserved. Uh, very interesting work. And then probably. Two or three years after I graduated, a gentleman approached me and said, hey, we want you to come work in industry. And, uh, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money as a technician. I had a young family. And uh, they said, we'll double your pay if you come work in industry. And uh, while I was doing very satisfying work at the university, the chance to uh, better take care of my family uh, was enough of an incentive. So I moved from Raleigh to Atlanta, and I worked for the next several years in, in industrial chemistry type job. So what was your classical training uh, leading up to all of this biology and chemistry? Did you have a lot of biology and chemistry classes? So I, I went to a small country school. Actually, if you've ever seen the Andy Griffith show, that's my home. <laughs> I literally am from Surrey County, Mount Airy, North Carolina. So at our school, we had one biology, one chemistry, uh, one computer class. So I convinced the chemistry teacher, if I could find nine other people with me, we would have a second year of chemistry. So we actually did have a second year of chemistry when I was in high school, but pretty standard. I don't know if you're old enough to remember, Radio Shack used to make a computer called TRS-80s. Yep. <laughs> uh, we called it Trash-80s. Yeah, uh, yeah, I remember that, those. Those were the computers I remember in our high school. We actually had, we had a few of those. I guess today it would be called the, the college I took some AP classes. I don't think I took AP English. Uh, it was too much work and I wasn't interested in it. But definitely the physics, the chemistry, the, the math, the computers, uh, whatever my school offered. And I took Latin. I, I know that's not a spoken language anymore, but for some reason I didn't want to take Spanish and that was our only two choices. <laughs> uh, I think what the Latin helped out is with your vocabulary because you can recognize a lot of words that are derived from some Latin words. That's interesting. I, I actually took Greek when I was in college, and I think if you actually took Greek and Latin, which was a part of a classical education, I guess, that gives you much deeper insight into the language that we use. So I would have to agree with that. Actually, I became a, a big fan of Greek through uh, studying the Bible. And uh, I do think the Romans were lazy and just stole the Greek language and super <laughs> their own alphabet. So, yeah, actually, when you talk with kids and you, you point out Greek words like Nike, the shoe brand, which was also a rocket and also a deity. Uh, Nike in Greek means uh, Nikio, the root word means to get the victory, which is a great, you know, it's just a wonderful word for a shoe. Michael Jordan and Nike have made billions of dollars. So. Well, they've, they've certainly taken that mantra uh, pretty far. So let's, let me, let me take a little bit of a left turn on you here. You've got a small company, the Blue Cube set. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Blue Cube and how you got from biology and chemistry to CubeSats, and tell us a little bit about what those are. Sure, so I worked in industry for a number of years, but my second child had, uh, she was born with a, a bad gene. My, my wife and I both gave her a bad gene, and she required a lot of attention. So I needed a job that would not force me to have to travel, so I could stay at home. I had recently substituted, I was in between jobs and was substituting at my daughter's school, and I realized my time in the military, 
my time in industry and working in labs. All of that was preparation to work with teenagers. And I just knew every you know, life has seasons. And it's important to know when you're in a certain season. And uh, I started teaching. So uh, as a teacher, I immediately was in a small school with no budget. Uh, and I immediately started organizing the kids to build some space flight hardware, which would take my two passions, aerospace and biochemistry, and uh, put them together. We pitched the idea to Northrop Grumman, which had a facility just down the road in uh, St. Augustine, Florida. The folks came to the, the pitch. Uh, my kids did a great job, the students. They said, we, uh, we, can't, we can't support you. You're a parochial school. We, we can't give money to a, a religious-based school. One of the nice ladies said, you should just start your own company. So I, I started a, a corporation with staff by kids. The entire goal was to elevate kids and prepare them for life. So I let them self-select which portion of the company they worked with. But we went about for the next several years to try to build space flight hardware, to grow bone cells in microgravity, to study uh, microgravity and boost bone loss. So moving forward, in 2009, someone said, hey, you should apply for this fellowship in D.C. Uh, it was called the uh, Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship. So I applied for that. Didn't think I would receive it. I did. But I met some folks through my fellowship, and uh, we started a company that you referred to, Blue Cube Aerospace. Uh, as a result of having met here in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., and seeing an opportunity where we could, we thought we could make a difference and have some fun while we're at it. So tell us a little bit about uh, Cube Satellites and what they are and, and how kids get involved in that. Sure. I'm going to hold up a picture. Can you see these? Um, I can, but our audience won't because we're just yeah. recording audio on this. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask you to send me the photos. We'll put them up in the show notes sure, um, sure. so people can look at them. Sure. So when I got to NSF, I, I learned that when universities were teaching engineers how to build satellites, often from the time a satellite's conceived until the end of its life, that might be 30 years. That time span is too great to have students be a part of that. So two professors in California came up with a class of satellites. They refer to them as nanosats. The, the CubeSat form factor is basically a 10 centimeter cube that has a mass of about one kilogram. And they're very small, but they basically have every subsystem that a functioning large satellite would, with the exception of environmental control and life support. And, excuse me, what that form factor enabled the students to do was to design, build, test, and fly the satellite within the time they were an undergraduate. So within four years, they could go from the very, you know, they could go through the entire design, build, test, fly process, which is very important hands-on engineering training. So we uh, envisioned that why should you wait until college to do that? Why not have junior high? And high school kids learn about satellites. They get introduced to concepts like systems engineering and uh, have a competition where the students, uh, the young students, would build their kit and use their kit uh, to collect and analyze data. And then once they had the kit, after the competition, they could dream up, come up with their own experiments, and then they have a piece of hardware to carry out those experiments. So I guess having never been close to a satellite or a launch or a spaceship, how do you get a, a nanosat into space? Like, how does that happen? Well, first of all, I think an interesting question is, where does space begin? Because <laughs> some would argue, well, there are many lines where some folks say this is space or this is not space. The uh, Air Force used to give astronaut wings to the X-15 pilots in the 60s at, I want to say, 62 statute miles. Uh, they have a, a common line now. I, I want to say that's 400,000 feet or 300,000 feet or so. But you ask the question, how do you get these in orbit? A lot of folks use uh, what I like to call the four-man satellite, which is a high-altitude balloon. You may have seen the, the gentleman jump out of the Red Bull, the high-altitude balloon with it. He literally broke the sound barrier. Yeah, yeah. So just imagine that, except you have a payload. It goes up. You can get 60 to 90,000 feet. You have the curvature of space. You can see the black of space. You're above 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere. Then you're at some point, your balloon bursts, and you'd have a parachute or not, and your payload returns there. 
So that's uh, one way. Are there other ways that, you, that these can go up? Uh, absolutely. The part of the new space movement, there are several companies that want to do a horizontally launched spacecraft. In fact, DARPA just published the big study. They're really interested in uh, using, say, an F-15 or a Learjet if you're not military, carrying a small rocket on the belly of the jet. You go out over, in our case, the Atlantic Ocean. You pitch the nose up shortly before the jet stalls. You release a rocket, and it, it's already above you know, 60,000 feet, the thickest, most dense part of the atmosphere, which requires the most energy to escape from. And uh, you're able to uh, theoretically put nanosats, like the CubeSats, into orbit. Just, I, I don't know that much about the cost of these kind of things. How much does a weather balloon version cost, and how much does it cost to launch a rocket-style version like, like that? Uh, I'd say students are doing payloads of balloons almost daily somewhere in the U.S. Uh, they're on the magnitude of, uh, depending on what your experiment costs. Uh, I want to say the helium is more expensive than the balloon in a lot of cases. The, the helium might even be more expensive than your payload. So I'd say you know around $1,000 or less for a balloon, whereas uh, these nanosats from the design, build, test, integrated into a a rocket, let's say as a secondary payload, might be on the magnitude of a, a million, million and a half dollars, which is many factors lower than, say, a communication or a spy satellite, which are on the hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. That's actually the reason for their popularity is the cost. The, with the miniaturization of electronics, it's almost like uh, all the things that were out of reach 10 years ago now are quite accessible to the Internet. Uh, there's high school kids right now building some spacecraft. Sorry, now my brain is spinning and I can't turn it off. So has anyone ever thought of launching a rocket that is towed up by a weather balloon? Um, or, or, or is the physics bad on that? I, I, I haven't done any calculations on that. I, I want to say I've seen something like that. I Actually, I have seen somebody pitch that. Airships, they use the large airships. Richard Branson, for instance, he's wanting to also carry a rocket. There's another company called Strata Launch, but I would say yes. I think I've seen images of the airships that float. So, you know, the air is most dense at sea level, and that's the, you know, the high cost, the energy cost of getting something in orbit. Once you're above 60,000 feet, the energy costs are much lower. So you were a teacher for a while. How did you end up going from being a teacher to working at NSF? Uh, through the fellowship. There's a the Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship allows about two dozen teachers a year to be assigned to federal agencies to work in what I'd call policy areas, programmatic areas, with the uh, intention that you, you go back, you know, after your year is up. I was asked to stay a second year, and then a position was created for me to sort of continue what I was doing. So this is my sixth year. So you have an interesting perspective having you know, been through so many areas of technology and teaching and working at NSF. For the first question we always like to ask our podcast guests, and that is, in the digital age, uh, with Google and Wikipedia and all of these resources, we can go out and find information. What does it mean in that environment to be, uh, quote, educated? So I, I think knowledge is freely available in the era that we live in now, but understanding is not quite as prevalent. So, you know, I could give my students Gray's Anatomy, the book that the med school students use, uh, but that doesn't mean they understand how all the parts fit together. So uh, I think despite having a wealth of knowledge, I would say that having all the knowledge available to you is a great tool, but it does not guarantee understanding. So what are some of the clever ways you've seen working there at NSF that people use in order to go from knowledge to understanding in the sciences. If you'd indulge me, just explain NSF for a minute. Sure. NSF was created as a result of being technologically behind the Germans at the onset of World War II. And so the thinking was the government should never be caught again behind from a technological standpoint. So the federal government provides a lot of research dollars primarily to academic institutions. And there's been a lot of good work over the years done at NSF but NSF is about a seven plus billion dollar entity. The portion to which I'm assigned is outside the, the main focus. So the primary center of mass for NSF is basic 
science and discovery. So in the engineering directorate, which is only one of seven directorates at NSF, it's all about applied. It's, it's more applied than basic research. The division to which I'm assigned, I affectionately refer to as the fringe lunatic of NSF <laughs> because not only do they not fund just institutions, academic institutions, they fund small businesses, you know, for-profit entities, and industry, university, cooperative or collaborative research. So they're, they're academic institutions that are working to help solve problems in industry. So that, I think, is a very good use of taxpayer dollars. Have you heard of Qualcomm in San Diego? Uh, yeah. Qualcomm was a tiny little company in the 80s that got a very small grant from NSF through the Small Business Innovation Research Program. So they're one of the shining stars of the program. Gotcha. Um, so do you work much with uh, education-based programs, or do you work mostly with uh, technology programs there? So those are those words actually overlap. You know, it's hard to parse. It's hard to have an education research project that doesn't involve technology. And all of NSF projects are required to have, they're all evaluated on broader impacts uh, and doing some societal good. So almost all the technology is going to result in some education and Definitely the, the education companies that are funded are all using some sort of technology. So, so let me back up to the, to the previous question that I had. Are there companies out there that you're aware of that are spending a lot of time trying to help uh, middle school, high school students, maybe as uh, far out as uh, community college students, transition from you know kind of a, a knowledge basis of thinking to an, a deeper understanding basis of thinking? Well, I can't give you any companies specifically by name, I think there's a, a movement, let's say, in formal education away from a degree and what that means. Some companies are, I would say, are more interested in certification. Uh, what, what can you actually do? What you know is a hard thing to quantify, but if you, if you give a kid a broken computer and say troubleshoot, repair, you know, replace or repair X, XYZ, the kid either does it or does not do it well. And that's evidence of competency, right? And doing something. And you mentioned about what it means to be educated. Isn't that really a, a good indicator of your education is if you can bring value to an organization? Obviously, you'll bring some value to yourself. But in the end, when you graduate, unless you've inherited a trust fund, you're going to need to earn your keep. And that requires that you bring value to whomever you're employing. So I guess we don't think about that a lot in education. We certainly think about that a lot from the company side. You and I obviously think about that a lot. Have you know working with small companies? You know how do we, right. you know how do we meet the bottom line? How do we solve the problems that are in front of us? And I'm not asking for a hard number here, but your experience. How many students that you see on a regular basis? What percentage do you think have that ability to to do versus just to know? I'd say a lot's changed recently. But uh, it would depend. That, that's a tough question because every individual kid has their own set of motivations and especially the influence of their parents or their home life. If you're teaching in a, a really tough um, Title I school, that means a lot of free lunch and there's zero parent involvement, those kids are going to have challenges that the kids whose folks work in Silicon Valley or you know all their dads and moms work at Lockheed down the road. The quality of the home life has a lot to do with that kid before you ever see them in the classroom. So there are certain barriers that some kids have had that are difficult. You know, they're challenges, definitely. Uh, I will say this. There's a lot of emphasis with efforts like FIRST Robotics to uh, put uh, hands-on. You know, not just theory, but hands-on. I like the maker movement. I'm a big fan of the, the maker movement and Neil Gersenfeld the Fab Labs, the, uh, if you can dream it, you can make it. Uh, another uh, good thing about the time we live in is the, the reduction in costs and, and the uh, explosion of 3D printing. 3D printing lets a kid basically, if they can think it and they can get it on the screen, they can print something, you know, and it, it, makes, it, it makes very tangible the things that are in their head. I think that's a great uh, empowering tool. There is not enough of that going on, and every school should have maker labs, but baby steps. I think that's the direction we're going. Well, a lot of the people that I talk to would certainly agree with you. We certain, you know, we run a lot in circles with the maker crowd, and uh, I think 
I mean, the reason we're here is because we believe what you just said. Mm -hmm. my, my personal philosophy is with respect to how to really incentivize a kid is competition. Because I, I don't consider myself um, necessarily a great teacher, but I was a pretty good coach, sports coach. And um, there's a lot of principles in team sports that apply to life. Uh, not everyone does the same job. Not everyone has to be equally good. You have to know your job, be good at it. And there are always winners and losers. That is life. If two people are applying for a job, somebody's going to be the winner, somebody will be the loser. We live in a very competitive world. And uh, a lot of kids, personally, in my opinion, is a lot of parents don't do their kids justice by preparing them to be contributors in society uh, and being able to add value to that organization. I do think the sweet spot is when you can find someone that will pay you to do that thing you're really passionate about in the first place. Those few people should be, they are very happy. They're, they have a lot of joy when the thing that they love the most is what someone pays them to do. So, so I guess I should have keyed into this a little earlier. You know, at, with your experience as a teacher, you said you, you believe that competition has a, a big impact on motivating kids to learn and to grow and, and, and I agree with you I I think it's difficult uh, for a kid coming out from school in an environment where we don't always emphasize competition that much into a world that seems to be somewhat defined by competition that that somehow we haven't talked about that and that's kind of a little that's a dirty little subject we don't talk about much in education but maybe we should and well also uh, in the US as opposed to say other countries it's even okay to fail as long as you learn from it and improve. Uh, and that's the thing as a sports coach, when your team loses a game, you're able to make a lot more corrections and adjustments and improvements after a loss than after an easy win. And um, same thing with learning. In Florida, I had the privilege of taking several teams to uh, the Army Corps of Engineers that have an annual engineering competition, civil, mechanical, automotive, coastal engineering, something in that arena. I took kids to the Pete Conrad Spirit of Innovation. I had some success at different kinds and, and, and different types of engineering, hands-on team competitions. I think those were, at least by my kids' testimony, my former students, they were very memorable. They impacted them. And there was a great satisfaction when they did well. There was also a need to do better when they didn't do well. So there's nothing like having a bad game to make you do better on the next one. So with your perspective across uh, education, uh, science labs, NSF, uh, starting a company, coming into our last question here, and we'll wrap this up pretty quick. What is the purpose of an education, given that perspective that you have? And you know, we get a lot of answers to this, so I'm not looking for the right answer. But you know, from your perspective, what is the purpose of an education? Well, for the individual, it is to give them a chance for success in society for the individual. A society needs its population to be educated so you don't make uh, bad decisions with policy, with elections, just quality of life in general. But for the individual to be educated, I think that means they have the tool set that they can be a lifetime learner. I, I think the folks that say they peaked in high school or, or even college, there's a lot of life you live you know, in a normal lifetime after 22 or 24. But to be educated means you have the ability to receive information. And uh, as I used to tell my students, you should be less dumb when you go to bed than you were when you woke up. You know, uh, I like that. I like every that. Every day you have an opportunity to learn something new. If you're physically able to put your clothes on and get out of the bed, it is, a, it is important, it's vital that you go out and learn because you know, you hear statements like uh, the jobs that, you know, elementary kids will have in the future. They don't exist. Yet. You know, the, the rate of change seems so much different than even you know, in my youth that if you're not a constant learner, if you're not constantly uh, assessing and analyzing the things around you, your opportunities are greatly diminished. Well, I think that we will wrap it up right there. Now, why don't we... I'll ask you to stay on for a little bit afterwards, but um, how would you like people to be able to get a hold of you or make comments to you or ask questions? Uh, let, tell us how to get in touch with you. Sure. Uh, 
Our website is bluecubesat.com. My email is ksimmons at bluecubesat.com. I'd, I'd be glad to answer any questions I, I receive, and I'll share them with you, obviously. Uh, uh, but I, I think the website, I'd like to point people to the website. We have a, a competition in November at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it's a CubeSat remote sensing and, and geosciences challenge where kids will um, a very multidisciplinary competition. So I look forward to getting to engage with the kids with that competition. Excellent. Well, we will link that up in the show notes. Thank you, Kevin, so much for taking some time to talk to our audience. I uh, really appreciate your time, and please keep up the good work. Oh, thank you. If you've been enjoying the conversations and insights here on the podcast, share it with a friend. Great ideas demand to be shared. You can also help fellow parents and educators by subscribing to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast in iTunes, leaving a rating, and writing a review. If you use Android, subscribe, leave us a rating, and write a review in Stitcher. Links to subscribe can be found at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast. Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students?